Hello, I'm Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Welcome to another episode of our archaeogastronomical adventures. I hope I find you all well health-wise and enjoying the summer, despite the circumstances. Today we'll be talking about a huge subject, really. Um, something that spanned more than a thousand years which will be really challenging um, gastronomic history to cover, really. But that's the joy of um, looking into the gastronomic past. Um, we'll try and find what part of, uh, of it is pretty much part of the present. And of course, we'll try and discover anything truly nostimos. Nostimos means, in a sense, um, delicious in Greek. And the root of the word nostimos derives from um, the Greek word nostos, which means um, homecoming in uh, Homeric Greek, and it's always an event to be savored. So the etymology of uh, nostalgia, the yearning or aching for home or some uh, lost past, can also be traced in the same root. So hopefully throughout uh, this uh, thousand year long travel today into the distant past I hope um, I can take you back to truly truly nostimos times what else could it be but the gastronomic treasures of the Byzantine Empire where do I begin uh, with the cuisine and food of the Byzantine Empire it's simply a daunting task as this empire was stretching over three continents at its peak and with over 1,100 years of culinary history. You can imagine, dear listener, the challenge I am facing. What should be my emphasis? Where do I concentrate? Well, as is a very complex subject, let's start from the very beginning. I guess. The Byzantine Empire was the eastern part what was known to her inhabitants as the Roman Empire. It was the one that stood intact, carrying the traditions and the light of civilization from ancient Greece and Rome after the fall of, of its western counterpart, the Western Roman Empire, and it carried well for over a thousand years, as I said earlier. The center and the pride of the emperor and the empire was the second Rome, Constantinople, a vast metropolis built by Constantine the Great on the site of the ancient Greek city of Byzantium, or Byzantium, as the Greeks called it, and destined to continue the glory of Rome, preserving the knowledge of the ancients in its libraries long after the original Rome had fallen to the hands of the various Germanic, Frankish and Lombard barbarian hordes. Inevitably, the gastronomical, medical and philosophical understanding of the Romans continued too, thriving in the eastern part, enriched all along the way with newly made contacts with the Sassanids and the Arabs, and of course um, these contacts weren't always peaceful, mostly were um, wars and conquests and loss of territories and of course other great civilizations of the late antiquity. All these contacts, together with the trade in foods, spices, animals and plants from the Far East, even further away from India, continued throughout the history of the Byzantine Empire and enriched the foods and the gastronomic traditions which continued evolving in more than one ways and, in doing so, gave us a tangible link between the modern Greek cuisine and the ancient Greek cuisine. When the railways arrived in the 19th century, Constantinople, as the city of Istanbul was still then known, became the terminus of the famed Orient Express, running all the way from Paris. The engineers prepared a splendid approach, blasting a line that followed the original city walls, three quarters of the way round the peninsula on which Istanbul stands. So that the railway ended up eventually at a grand station on the opposite, 
northern side of the town. This is uh, where Agatha Christie arrived to when she travelled out to Baghdad. From here, she had to leave her train and then embark on a ferry to cross the legendary Bosporus to another railway station on the other side, in Asia, and continue her trip through Anatolia to Damascus and subsequently to Baghdad. Well, you might um, wonder what the hell the railways and Agatha Christie have to do with um, ancient Constantinople and uh, the food of the Byzantine Empire. The ancient city of Istanbul, well, over the 20th century, and especially from the 60s onwards, as the ancient city was becoming a modern metropolis, one of the biggest problems that faced, together with counter other ancient cities, of course, and capitals, was transportation. So early on the 21st century, the Marmarai Railroad Project and Metro Lines were intended to be the solution to this problem. And as the solution to this problem, for the first time in history, Europe and Asia would be connected with a railway line passing underneath Bosporus. At this point, early 21st century, Istanbul city has grown to a huge metropolis spanning two continents and more than 15 million inhabitants. So the biggest transfer station project is in the Yenikapi region, where a massive station was to be built. And here, while they were digging for the station and the metro lines, here was revealed one of the biggest harbours known into the ancient world, dating back from the Byzantine era, the Theodosius Harbour. So the directorates of Istanbul Archaeology Museums started a detailed salvage excavation, which turned into the most comprehensive archaeological excavation in Istanbul's history. This took place over 58,000 square metre area, with approximately 12 metre deep filling. The excavations confirmed that the harbour, which once was established on a natural bay, had filled up with the soil from the ancient Lycos River, and now residing 300 metres away from the sea. The Theodosia harbour was much further inland than expected. The silting up had taken place to a far greater extent than the archaeologists and the engineers have ever realised. So during the excavations, Amongst the group of findings, there were 36 shipwrecks, dating between the 5th and the 10th century AD, and it was the biggest collection of early and middle Byzantine period shipwrecks. These are important because of the very well-preserved state. Several of them had been very spectacular, with a large number of amphorae still in position when they sank in the harbour. Most of them were medium-sized merchantmen, but there were also several smaller vessels. Projecting out into the harbour were numerous jetties, some of which survived. What is of interest here, for us, is the cargo of these vessels, of course. Their discovery brings into light fascinating clues of the life in the late ancient city, and of course the early medieval period, and offers some direct evidence of the foods and trading goods of the Byzantine Empire. There had been a cargo of large container jars, which we call amphorae, some of which contained remains of fish bones. Many of them contained garum, the Roman sauce that we covered in detail on episode 5, still a popular and a common sauce in the Byzantine Empire, almost a thousand years after the height of the Roman Empire. Cooking utensils were also found in the stern area of the ship, including a stove-like brazier and its lid, a cooking pot, two cups, a juglet, a glass goblet, and also cherry seeds were found in a basket, and olive and peach seeds too. All this provide information about the crew's food supplies. The wreck itself was dated to the 9th century AD, so at the peak of this powerful and long-lasting empire. At this time, Constantinople was still thought as the biggest, most spectacular city in the whole of the world. Indeed, it was called the eye of the world. We do not know if we were on heaven or earth, a 10th century Kievan Russian delegation to the city reported. But we cannot forget such beauty. It was certainly one of the most cosmopolitan capitals too, with Slavs, Bulgars, Franks, Serbs, Vikings, all the way from Scandinavia, Rus, Armenians, 
and perhaps even Indians and merchants and diplomats from even further away, all of whom roamed the massive boulevards, trading goods between far-flung empires. All in all, a huge and highly complex task, trying to decipher which foods and gastronomic um, elements and recipes I can concentrate on this podcast. I think the best thing to do is just get a, a general outline um, as much as I can from the early Byzantine Empire to, to the fall of Constantinople in 1453. So more or less, we'll cover items and um, recipes and histories and anecdotes from different eras so we can have a general idea what what happened. And then probably I will expand on a later episode on more specifics. So for clarity's sake, um, we may find continuities from Greek antiquity through Byzantium to the cuisine of today. And this might seem like a good obvious point to start. What we see in, throughout the history, of course, of the Byzantine Empire, we have developments, sometimes drastic ones, sometimes um, slower ones, which can explain by the by the changes of climate, especially of precipitation, but also by anthropogenic uh, changes. Whether the diet became poorer due to disappearance of basic ingredients because of war and loss of territories, or changes in cooking and eating habits, or contrary to that. We can observe when the diet became richer thanks to the influence of non-Mediterranean immigrants such as Slavs, Southern Arabs, nomads from Central Asia, Turks, Crusaders and others who brought not only new agricultural products, vegetables and fruits, but also new methods of preparing or refining food. Uh, an important aspect of differentiation in alimentary habits is also the geographical extent of the Byzantine Empire. As I said very early on, at its extent covered uh, three continents. So in the age of uh, Justinian I, encompassed nearly the entire coastline of the Mediterranean with extended hinterlands. Then obviously the empire shrunk, it went smaller, and then by the, by the end of the first millennium, had again reached um, almost 1.3 million square kilometers. All these elements influenced how the Byzantine cuisine developed. On top of that, we also have the big influence of, the, of Christianity and um, all the religious um, festivals, traditions, and of course, um, elements from uh, the cuisines of, um, of the different fractions, let's say, of, of Christianity, from the Jews and the Coptic Egyptians to the monastic and ascetic elements of uh, Christianity. So the shape of Byzantine cuisine and gastronomy takes place in a multicultural field of action, stretching generally and usually uh, from the Ionian Sea to Cyprus and the Caucasus and from Danube to the Euphrates River. And this is kind of mapped out in a lot of the narratives of the various gastronomic escapades and popular songs at the time, sometimes both mixed in one. Also obvious is uh, that we have plenty of accounts of presentations of the luxurious dining habits and possibilities open to the imperial court and the upper classes of Byzantium. This is um, clearly something obvious the big banquets of the emperors were always part of um, of an elaborated ceremonial process in order to to impress foreign visitors and dignitaries. As um, they considered themselves the center of uh, of the world, they were still called the Roman Empire. And while they were thinking uh, the Western Roman Empire had collapsed to the barbarians. Obviously, they wanted always to impress all these barbarians as well. These elaborate feasts and banquets, they influenced a lot of uh, the Game of Thrones uh, uh, scenes, food scenes, 
multiple dishes, huge tables uh, with flowers and tablecloths and music and huge halls filled with hundreds of guests and so on and so on. So I think you can get a picture, you can get a, a picture of, uh, of how big and um, complicated the feasts, the feasts of the emperors were. But contrary to that too, we have um, from, uh, from texts and books of the time, we have plenty of discussions of the modest and often difficult nutritional normality of staple foods for the masses, who include soldiers also in these discussions about the staple foods for the masses, and also all those who embraced um, the monastic life. There were times that um, the priesthood and the monks and so on, they, they were around 15% of the overall population. So we're talking about a huge amount of people, which clearly that uh, required different diet uh, according to the Christian calendar. And of course, in turn, that influenced a lot of the diet and foods of the normal people and of course the aristocracy and everybody else like the emperor who wanted to appear pious and uh, religious and respectful to the patriarch and the church itself. Also physicians and dietitians and doctors all played an important role uh, in the changing and usually strict food habits of the population. I'll um, mention again that uh, all these, all these different elements, all these different anchors, all these different points make it difficult to find one single defining anchor for the Byzantine cuisine, as you can imagine. So I think instead of getting um, hooked into one thing and expanding uh, for hours, I think I will meander across topics, ingredients and different historical moments uh, tiptoeing carefully from one ingredient to another recipe to a description by a writer or, or a diplomat or a cook or a monk's writings. Hopefully tasting as many flavors as we can during my research for this episode. The gastronomic world of the Byzantine Empire wasn't isolated from outside influences and its innovations not merely work of the Greeks, its recipes not just based in the Roman Empire's model. It is quite telling that on two significant occasions an encounter between the Greek world and the gastronomic wealth of the Orient involving the capture of a royal palace in Persia marks the start of an era in two gastronomically distinctive periods, conveniently lasting about a millennia each. Firstly, in 1331 BC, with Alexander the Great, and again in AD 628 with the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius. The first great gastronomic age of some 900 years sees Alexander beginning a new era which will prove to be a watershed in dietary and culinary history, when the Mediterranean, and Europe to a general extent, came into even closer contact with the abundance, the rumored and almost conspiratorial in nature excesses, and the traditions and the produce of the Middle East, Persia and India. This led to and brought about the gastronomic fusion, or to use a Greek word here, syncretism, which was seen in successive Hellenistic, Roman and early Byzantine incarnations. This watershed moment is like the one more familiar to us nowadays, the one that followed the exploitation of Native America and its resources, when a number of new items were imported into Europe, like potato, tomato, corn, peppers, turkey, cocoa, and thus new gastronomic uh, habits were created. So this era would be followed by a second age whose conventional starting point is in the 7th century AD, and this considered the end of the ancient world, 
and the start of the predominantly Christian Byzantine gastronomy, when the Mediterranean trilogy of wine, oil and bread once again encountered the flavors of the Orient in the Persian capital just before the Arabs took it and took control of these riches once and for all, which alongside Egypt, which was of great importance as it was known as the breadbasket of the empire. Along with the exotic birds and game in the royal gardens of Persia and the silks stored in the palaces, thanks to the campaign of the emperor Heraclius, the Byzantine conquerors counted amongst the trophies a whole host of flavors and spices, marveling at quasi-mythical items such as pepper, sugar and ginger. From here, we clearly see the start of a new period of some 800 years in which Constantinople emerged as the de facto gastronomic space, having created its own culinary propositions. It is obvious that this gastrogenesis is a synthesis based on the late antiquity and its traditions and all sorts of influences from the East, West and, having become established as the Christian capital of wine and gastronomic delights in the medieval world. In the end though, its destiny was to be overthrown by Western Christendom in 1204 with the sack of Constantinople from the Venetians and the Crusaders and finally from the Islamic East in 1453. But let's go back uh, a couple of centuries earlier on in the, in the epoch of uh, Justinian I when uh, the empire was massive, when it was stretching all across the Mediterranean and the capital Constantinople was a bustling hive of activity. One can only imagine all the senses being overwhelmed with the sights and scents and aromas from the multitude of spice markets fish markets, butchers and bakers baking all sorts of breads and all these scents mixing with the holy incense from the myriad of Christian churches and the plumes of smoke rising from the chimneys of the biggest city the world had seen with nearly half a million people. For an idea of the everyday life and food um, and food habits of uh, the inhabitants of Constantinople we learn from the book of Eparch about the number of provisions and providers. First of all, one had to go to the Artopios, who sold fresh bread every morning. The next address was Saldamarius, the grocer, who offered non-perishable merchandise of all kinds, including tiron, cheese, and vutiron, butter. He also sold oil and olives, legumes, honey, salted meat and fish, but not the more expensive fresh fish and fresh meat, which was distributed by the Ichthyoprate fishmongers, the Machelari, the butchers for lamb and mutton, and Hirembori, the pork butchers. Beef is not mentioned in the Book of Eparch. Wine was offered in the Capellion, which is a tavern, together with soups and other simply prepared dishes. The bakers of Constantinople were in the most favorite of trades with a range of privileges. As the text tells us, bakers are never liable to be called for any public service, neither themselves nor the animals, to prevent any interruption of the baking of bread. The basic food of the Byzantine army as well was cereal, and it was in several convenient forms. Of great importance was the barley biscuit, which was named after the late Hellenistic cook Paxanus. It was certainly food for the soldiers and priests, and the knowledge of it spread more widely than the fame of many other luxuries. So the Paximadion is still known in Greece by that name, and in Arabic is Baximat, in Turkish Bexemad, in Romanian Pesmet, and in Venetian, Pasimata. And Pasimata is the kind of bread that we find out in Crete nowadays, which is called Dakos, which is a double-baked uh, rusk uh, barley bread. And yeah, as we see, it's still very, very popular in um, a, lot of, um, a lot of the islands. 
and of course um, other places in Greece which um, either there's not much wheat or people who want to preserve uh, the bread and make it long lasting. In any case, tacos uh, nowadays is being used in a lot of salads, so as it's dry and it can last for a long time, you need to soak it on something. And so the juices of a sun-drenched summer Greek tomato with extra virgin olive oil is the perfect thing to soak the tacos. And once it, it absorbs all this beautiful liquid, then it becomes soft and loses the, the dryness of the crunch, and um, you have all this explosion of flavor in your mouth, really, which really, really says uh, summer holiday in Greece. A second typical food was the crocked baked bread, close to pita bread in style, called klibanites. Suitable for army use because klibanos, in which it was baked, was portable. Also well known was a millet porridge called piston. In that early period of uh, the Byzantine Empire, one of the earliest accounts um, of the cuisine we have that gives us information about the foods is um, around the 6th century AD from um, Anthemus, who was um, a Byzantine physician and doctor who was condemned by the emperor in Constantinople to a life of exile. So he was at the court of the Ostrogoth king Theodoric the Great, and then he was uh, sent as an ambassador to the king of the Franks. And there, he wrote to his uh, fierce yet royal host a letter about foods, which were good, which were bad, and how to cook and serve them. It shows us uh, uh, cooking on the cusp between uh, the bread, vegetable and the oil cuisine of the Mediterranean and the meat-dominated cookery of the northern forests. The book uh, that survives, or the letters that survive uh, from uh, Anthemus, are called on the observance of foods, and it's a valuable source uh, for uh, Byzantine dietetics. So from Athimus we have a beef stew, which is uh, rich and aromatic, and we have a rice pudding, which is pleasantly tangy, according to um, the researchers. So here we have a recipe from that book, from Anthemus, which is um, afraton, it's called afraton, the dish. It reminds me a lot of um, the modern souffle, in a way. Okay, so here's the recipe. Greek has the name of frutum, for what is called spumeum in Latin. It is made from chicken and white of egg. You must take a lot of white of egg so that your frutum becomes foamy. It should be arranged in a mount on a shallow casserole with a previously prepared sauce based on fish sauce underneath. Then the casserole is set over the coals and the afrutum cooked in the steam of the sauce. The casserole is then placed in the middle of a serving tray and a little wine or honey poured over it. It is eaten with a spoon or a small ladle. We often add fine fish or scallops to this dish because they are very good and also common at home. The main components of the diet of a Middle Byzantine uh, were in order of consumption the following wild greens or cultivated vegetables, pulses, dried fruit and nuts, fresh fruit, fish, freshwater fish from the lakes and, and also fish from the sea, salt cured or smoked, cereal based products like bread, noodles, pies and pastries, dairy, fats, meat like poultry, pork or lamb or kid and game, salt cured meat, eggs, wine, oil, honey, and spices. Other than in the regions of the empire that produced them, oil and wheat flour, rather than barley flour, were precious items, constantly in short supply. Typically, in the time of Basil I, so that was 1867 to 1886 AD, a lack of oil meant that even the oil lamp chandeliers in Hagia Sophia could not be lit. Although, for the general population and for general consumption, olive oil from the Smyrna region of the coast of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Izmir in Turkey, was transported to the capital, or on occasions raiding Arab merchant vessels were captured by the Byzantines uh, while they were transporting oil from Sicily. There is a much-cited uh, piece of evidence for the lack of wheat 
oil and wine due to the climate in Central Asia Minor, as well as a tale of foil stolen from the monastery of St. Nikon in the heart of the oil-producing Sparta region in the 11th century. Other fats and oils, which have been used as alternatives to olive oil for culinary purposes, were sesame seed oil and walnut oil. These were prevalent in the diet of most Byzantine people, alongside with animal fats and butter, when permitted of course, outside the strict and long Lent periods which the general populace was subject to. Of course, the monks and other ascetics weren't allowed any of these kind of fats due to the strict monastic diet. Overall, the dining habits of the, of the Byzantine were markedly different from those of his contemporaries among the Franks, Slavs and Arabs. Franks, Slavs and other barbarians, as they were called by the Byzantines, they were either ignorant of or expressed a surprise at many of the following items. Paired knives and forks, heated dishes for sauces, like the gararion, finger bowls and napkins for drying hands, the use of garum, caviar, the rusk like uh, paximadia we just talked uh, earlier on, and uh, the resinated or raisin wine or sweet muscat wine. A lot of the spices the Byzantines used, and which were known long before that to the Romans, such as ginger, nutmeg and cinnamon, will not be used again in the West for a long, long time, regardless uh, of whether Athimus had recommended them in his Byzantine recipes to the Franks in the 6th century or not. Let's now see some uh, everyday food items of the Byzantine uh, table. Firstly, we have sausages. The Byzantine word for sausage, salsicion, comes from the Latin, from the word salsicium, where the salsus means salty, as is in the case in many Romans languages, such as Italian, we have salsiccia, Spanish, salsichon, or French, saucisson, saucisse. The ancient name, and the one used in Byzantine literary Greek, was alas, for salty. Byzantine sausages were made using pig's intestines filled with minced pork, which was marinated in vinegar, with a lot of salt, fat, breadcrumbs, and various spices or wild greens. Then they were smoked to cure them. They were sold by the Alandopole, who also sold Chorde and Chordokilitsa, preparations made using the intestines, stomachs, lungs and liver, mainly of sheep, something like modern-day Gardumbi or Kokoreci. Dishes which are very popular in Balkans uh, today and in Turkey, and especially in Greece too, and uh, in Anatolia, and they mainly consist of lamb or goat intestines, often encasing seasoned offal. There's an extremely amusing story of Saint Simeon, the fool, that used to eat a string of salsicchia, walking along the streets, holding mustard for dipping purposes in the other hand. They were his delight in the morning, but he also enjoyed uncooked omon lardin, i.e. bacon. Sometimes, when Sunday came, he took a string of sausages and wore them as a deacon's stoli. In his left hand, he held a pot of mustard, and he dipped the sausages in the mustard and ate them from morning on. And he smeared mustard on the mouths of some of those who came to joke with him. Wherefore, also a certain rustic, who had left coma in his eyes, came to make fun of him. Simeon anointed his eyes with the mustard. The man was nearly burned to death, and Simeon said to him, Go wash, idiot, with vinegar and garlic, and you will be healed immediately. As it seemed a better thing to do, he ran immediately to a doctor instead, and was completely blinded. Finally, in a mad rage, he swore in Syriac, By the God of heaven! Even if my two eyes should suddenly leap from the sockets, I will do whatever the fool told me. And he washed himself as Simeon told him. Immediately, his eyes were healed, clear as when he was born, so that he honored God. Then the fool came upon him and said to him, Behold, you are healed, idiot. Never again 
steal your neighbor's goats. And after this funny anecdote about the life of Saint Simeon the Fool, let's continue on our exploration of the pork and meat. Pork was the best meat for curing. Paston or tarichon, lardos, lardin, apoctin, apakin, paspalia, siglenon. There were some of the names given to cured pork, and or some of them types of uh, smoked or cured and salted pork that they were eaten. So yeah, all this would be preserved in a variety of ways, such as smoked, as I said, or salt cured, or in fat, like confit. Cured meats were eaten either raw or cooked in pastomagiria with bulgur and greens, mainly cabbage. In the Byzantine period, Paphlagonia, in the northeast Asia Minor, was famous for cured pork meats, one of which was called gonde. Similarly, other cured meats first mentioned in the late Byzantine period, such as siglinon and paspalia, mainly used pork, which was stewed and stored in large jars in the resulting liquid. It may be that one version of paspalades, as their name suggests, from paspalizo to sprinkle, consisted simply of some sort of bacon or piece of cured pork simply sprinkled with flour and salt. Preparations made using offal and blood, such as gathia, Emalea or Ematias, which is our black puddings today, were also very popular with the Byzantines. Despite the Jewish and Christian prohibitions, Ematias particularly, must have been uh, widely consumed, apparently causing a number of cases of food poisoning uh, in the 9th century and leading the Emperor Leo VI to ban the consumption of Ematia. Uh, Emperor Leo was um, active 886 till 912 AD, and um, Leo's ban is in fact thought to be the first case worldwide of adopting special protective measures against botulism in sausages. Truffles, or truffes in uh, Byzantine, were considered a delicacy by the nobility and the upper classes in uh, Constantinople, and they were eaten raw, boiled or roasted as well. In the 11th century, Michael Psilos was amongst those who considered them a wonderful treat and described them in one of his letters as an expensive present. As in our own day today, they are still considered um, afedikon majerma, which means a food fit for princes. The writer Simeon Seth has bequeathed us with a recipe once again from the 11th century. Before cooking, they must be washed for many hours in water to clean them. Then we boil them in water containing salt, oregano and roux. Once they have been boiled, they are seasoned with oil, savory, pepper and garum. Apart from the use of garum and roux, this is almost exactly the same recipe used today with the addition of garlic and vinegar for grape hyacinth bulbs and for some fungi. Another popular delicacy of um, the time was uh, javiarion and otarion, which is caviar and botargo. So the terms uh, javiarion and uh, bergitikon for caviar and, um, and for sturgeon, the fish that produces the eggs for black caviar, begin to be mentioned in the middle and mainly in the late Byzantine period. And according to a host of testimonies, caviar was a highly sought after delicacy. A lot of the otariha, i.e. the salt-cured or smoked fish eggs, especially sturgeon's eggs uh, for the black caviar, were procured from the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So when we talk about um, cured fish eggs and fish raw in general, uh, we should know that there was, uh, as it is now obviously, but it was back then the case too, there was a distinction between the different types. So we have simple salt-cured fish eggs, otariha or avgotariha which were very common and not very expensive at all. Secondly, we had uh, botargo, which is the raw pouch of certain fish, so mostly tuna or grey mallet. And these ones were dried and cured in sea salt for a few weeks, 
and then sometimes coated in beeswax, as is the case uh, uh, even today in modern day in the town of Mesologi, which they make the best potargo in the Mediterranean. And thirdly, we have Javiarion, the black cured rose or dried raw pouches of sturgeon. Potargo was cut, as is nowadays, into very thin slices by the seller of caviar, and it was considered a luxury to be consumed with a good wine. John Apokavkos, metropolitan of Navpaktos, which is a town located near the lagoons of eastern Greece, in 1200-1233 AD, sent as a precious present to his counterpart in Athens, 100 sun-dried, two-lobed botargos. This undoubtedly came from the lagoons of Mesolongi, which, as I said, a few moments ago, still continues to produce the famous Avotaraham. As no one would be surprised uh, to find out, the Byzantines produced a variety of uh, cheeses and, and other dairy products, of course. So we have um, you know, a great variety of them being described in the, in the medical and dietetic texts of the Byzantine period. One fact which is quite interesting and kind of pinpoints us to the era of uh, the feta cheese, when it started actually developing, is um, we have a revised version of a book called uh, Geoponica, which is from the 10th century, and uh, mentions uh, and provides evidence of cheeses being preserved in brine, just like feta today, and of smoked cheeses too. Another interesting um, fact from the book is... Um, the serving of Tirepsetos Zomos, which is a cooked cheese, which is a cooked cheese soup, quite possibly a type of fondue, in the palace on the first Sunday of Lent, which is particularly uh, telling. Another interesting uh, fact is the detailed description in one of Michael Pselos's letters of the way milk was treated to produce a special kind of cheese. Some people, he tells us, were not satisfied with the natural, more simple method used by many shepherds, but intervened at the curling stage and skillfully managed to insert air in the still soft cheese, so as to form small holes, and thus they produced a cheese full of holes. An example, concludes Pselos, is Paphlagonian cheese, the perfect product of human ingenuity. It is true, Paphlagonia was famous for the choice products of its animal husbandry, Meats, as we've seen earlier on, from especially pork, and cheeses. This exceptional quality of the Paphlagonian cheese, which was loaded by Psellos, is corroborated by the evidence of another text of Simeon Seth from the same period. Uh, although Seth uh, recommends avoiding eating cheese as indigestible and harmful to health, he makes an exception for fresh, spongy form cheese especially the type that came from Paphlagonia, which clearly suggests uh, that the cheese from this region was uh, in regular supply in the capital. So all this uh, happening in the 11th century. Various kinds of cheeses um, came to Constantinople from the provinces, either as everyday products for mass consumption or as special orders for high-class foods and as gifts. We assume that the Paphlagonian cheese, described by Seth and Pselos, belongs to this second category. Less than a century later, so 12th century, references to two other cheeses imported to Constantinople, also with name places of origin, suggest that the city's upper classes had by then formed certain gastronomic tastes. In a letter dated uh, circa 1140, Michael Italicos, he talks about Cretan cheeses and Vlach cheeses, and the context is that he really appreciates the excellent quality of these cheeses. So obviously Cretan cheese is uh, quite well uh, renowned even today. We have the excellent Graviera cheese from Crete and Mizithra, which is a fresh goat cheese, um, which we use on tacos quite often. And of course there are other fantastic cheeses from uh, goat and sheep milk from Crete. Flach cheese on the other hand is again, it's very famous nowadays in Greece and uh, they consider the best cheese makers and it's the shepherds generally living in the mountainous regions of uh, the west and the central west Greece. The above two cheeses are uh, also mentioned in another 12th century text, and they were also used to produce uh, a stew type uh, known as uh, 
Monokithron. So Monokithron was a much fattier and more complicated and later in date um, version of the Tirepsistos uh, Zomos we mentioned earlier on the, the, the fondue type uh, cheese soup. We also have evidence of, um, of um, cheeses and uh, other dairy products from the time that suggest that there was a gradual shift uh, in the Middle Byzantine period from general and undefined uh, products to more specific and uh, more branded names. Certain types of high-quality cheeses, which were sought after by the upper class, Constantinopolitan clientele, in the 11th century began to be eaten by wider cross-section of the population. The variety of cheeses, moreover, is matched by the range of wines which flood the market in the capital. Again, we see here a shift um, in the gastronomic tastes of uh, the people as the centuries pass and the once scarce um, wines and uh, oils come back with a vengeance. Extremely popular was also the queens, which uh, the queens uh, preserve, or kidonaton. And it was, it was considered, queens was considered fruit and a dish fit for an emperor. We also have evidence that in medieval Constantinople, a variety of sweet fruits, like fresh figs, were sold in glass vessels. In Byzantium, desserts were an important part of the emperor's table. And, and moreover, along with wine and some dishes involving cheese, they are the only items among all the dishes in the complicated ritual of the extravagant receptions uh, in the Book of Ceremonies to be mentioned simply by name. Another very popular fruit of the medieval Byzantine period was citron or lemon. And although the citrus fruits were known to the ancient Greeks so long before Alexander the Great, it was thought that it was what Hercules brought to Greece from the, uh, the apples of Hesperides. They ended the diet very late at the Roman period, around the 1st century AD, and that's what they called citron, i.e. citrus in Latin, and um, it was, uh, we started noticing its use in cooking and in drinks. Before that, it was only mentioned as a use for, for an antidote, um, I guess to certain poisons, and for scenting clothes. So nevertheless, by the time we, we reach the late antiquity, it seems to be a fairly widespread in use, both in medications and in the preparation of a drink called Kitraton. And as the Byzantine period progresses and we reach uh, the Middle Byzantine period, there are references to sweets made with it. As uh, to other citrus fruits, we have lemons, obviously oranges, and some sort of uh, bitter orange. Um, in the 11th century, the monastery of Lavra in, um, in Athos cultivated citrons, and in the 12th century, an epigram was in fact dedicated to the bitter orange tree, Neragea. There is evidence of the cultivations of citrus fruits after the 12th century in the Peloponnese, on the islands, and some citrons in Western Greece are described as extremely aromatic, very big and large as buckets. In modern times, the Greek citron, especially the, the Corfiot variety, was used by the Jews, along with citrons from other places, as part of the ritual of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jews of Greece, the Romaniotes, believe that since the time of the Second Temple or earlier, this variety of Kitron has always been used by them for this religious ritual. Nowadays, the Corfiot variety has been transplanted to Israel and is cultivated there, while on Naxos and Crete, in recent centuries, Kitron has been used to make sweets, bonbons and drinks. Of all the well-known soups, zomos, plural zomi, which are mentioned in the Byzantine sources, the most common and best known, at least in monastic communities, were those prepared using onions and savory. These soups were commonplace in monasteries as magiria ayozomion, soup for the holy fathers. But even these, which were kind of a very cheap grab really, um, were considered by some monks to be soups for the glutinous a voluptuous sort of food. So what the Byzantines called Ayozumin was one of their most meager dishes. Just as at the other end of the scale, 
there was Monokithron, with its multiplicity of ingredients and high fat content. We have practically the whole recipe for Ayozumin, as well as for Monokithron. The recipe for Ayozumin is as follows. A lot of whole or chopped onions were stewed in water containing aromatic herbs such as savory and oil. We even know how it was served. Once the onions have been boiled and reduced to a pulp, the soup is poured over slices of dried bread, perhaps like the modern paximaria or rusks, which have been placed in a deep plate or cup until they are completely covered. In another case, they prepare the poma, a drink based on efkraton, i.e. a tea saying of pepper, cumin and dill, to which they added roasted onions. So that was the simple onion soup for the poor and the everyday eating of uh, the monks. On the other end we have monokithron, which are uh, using pork and bacon, poultry or fish, to which were added uh, cheeses, garlic, onions, vegetables and a lot of spices and seasonings. Finally in soups we have another version of onion soup, with pepper, with cheeses and other aromatic herbs, which uh, clearly we can't consider it anymore as a holy soup, but it's closer to the French onion soup. Another recipe we have from uh, the middle to late Byzantine era is uh, called uh, Chef Clohoulia, which is um, boiled um, beetroot served with cheese, of, um, cheese made of buffalo milk, just like um, modern day mo mozzarella, buffalo mozzarella. So I've done this recipe a few times in my events and um, yeah, basically boiled and sliced uh, beetroot, some sauteed uh, beetroot leaves, a few chopped walnuts, buffalo mozzarella, a few rocket leaves dressed with black pepper and olive oil with a bit of lemon. Another very popular dish uh, in the aristocratic circles was um, pork belly cooked um, in um, honey and wine, which was um, marinated in um, vinegar and honey for, um, for 24 hours and then uh, the meat was um, roasted and it was, it, was, it was cooked for a few hours in a clay pot in the oven over a slow fire and then served um, with, uh, well actually cooked with fresh cabbage or pickled cabbage and served with it. An interesting side dish was uh, mitoton which was kind of a um, garlic puree with um, olive paste. Of course, all these uh, rich and um, fatty dishes were also were part of the aristocracy and the emperor's table, but also the physicians and doctors of the time. We were recommending that they, they eat different types of um, uh, fresh herbs and vegetables and flowers in order to balance the humors and, and avoid diseases such as gout. So we have a recipe for a salad, the emperor's salad, which was a, a fresh salad made with parsley, parsley and onion with edible flowers and with a dressing of saffron, olive oil, lemon and uh, truffle vinegar dressing. And of course one of the most famous desserts in the Byzantine Empire was rice pudding. So rice pudding was boiled, cooked in milk, served with honey, chopped almonds, maybe apricots and dressed with cinnamon and rose water. As I said, um, the diet of um, the Byzantine Greeks the Roman, the Roman aristocracy of the Byzantine Empire was markedly different from the barbarians in the West. So we have um, this constant fight and battle between, between the two. And of course these small differences together with the religious differences in the Eastern Christianity, Western Christianity, slowly over the centuries uh, boil and amplify and exaggerate the, the schism between the two different parts of the, of the world. And um, we see this difference also in uh, how, how the Westerners talk about uh, the Byzantine cuisine, the, the emperor's table. And it's, um, we have an account from um, a bishop called Luptrand of Cremona, who was um, an ambassador of the German king Otto to the Byzantine court. And um, so yeah, one of the accounts that he gives us is, is the following. To add to our calamity, the Greek wine, on account of being mixed with pitch, resin and plaster, was to us undrinkable. 
later on, on a, on a Feast of the Emperors. I sat in the 15th place from him, and without a tablecloth. Not only did no one of my suit sit at table, but no one of them saw even the house in which I was guest. During the feast, disgusting and foul meal was served, which was washed down with oil after the manner of drunkards, and moistened also with a certain exceedingly bad fish liquor. Without a doubt, here we have um, an account of, uh, of a sort of Northern European person who complains about uh, uh, the Greek cuisine when he goes on holidays in Greece and um, the food is uh, drenched in olive oil and it's too 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 much of olive oil apparently but yeah that that reminds me of that of that exact moment and also notice that um, he talks about exceedingly bad fish liquor and that has to be with no doubt garum which was still very popular in the in the eastern mediterranean in the eastern roman empire but it was completely out of fashion and completely forgotten on the western part. So the Franks, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Germanic tribes and so on and all the kingdoms, they have completely forgotten about the fish sauce. And not, and not all in that, um, but um, yeah, most of the spices uh, uh, that have been used from the Roman era and continue to be used in the Byzantine era they were completely forgotten in the western part for the next 500 years. And here we conclude our trip to the fascinating cuisine of the Byzantine Empire. As I said, um, we've touched different areas of the cuisine from different times and um, we just really only scratched the surface of this really interesting period of uh, food and how how it develops from ancient Greek to Roman and then through to the Byzantine Empire and the late medieval period and how that transforms really later on with the Ottomans to give us the modern Greek food. Thank you for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was a delicious legacy podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and don't forget to subscribe on Patreon if you want to get the episodes early and ad-free, together with um, a host of um, other goodies, recipes, writings, further reading information. And here I would like to thank all my new patrons and bid you goodbye. Thanks for being with me on this truly nostimous food trip of a very, very fascinating era. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. <music>